OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. So 231, as we saw in the earlier slides, that this is the largest amount of funding that California receives, that is WIOA funded, that is WIOA funding. So we're gonna start out first with a poll, and that is how many program areas does the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act Section 231 cover? So let me launch that. Oh, someone already did. Thank you. So your choices are three, four, five, or I forgot my coffee. <laughs> oh, we have several people that have forgot their coffee. Wow, I appreciate so many people participating. <clears throat> We're almost to 60%. Give it a couple more seconds to see if we can get everyone to answer. Some people might not be back from break. Some people might be getting their coffee. All right, we're going to end that poll. Remember what your answer was. I'm going to share the results. We do have sort of a, um, a tie between three and four. Not quite a tie, but statistically, they're pretty close. So let's see what the answer is. Stop sharing. Let me close that. And on to our next slide. Let's count them. English language acquisition, English literacy and civics education. Note that there's no I in there. Adult basic education and adult secondary education. So if you said four, that is correct. So we'll be talking about each one of these areas throughout um, my presentation here for the next little bit. So I just wanted to remind you of what the definition of <laughs> in WIOA the definition of English language acquisition happens to be. And that is um, instruction for English language learners so that they can achieve competency in reading, writing, speaking, and the comprehension of the English language. And I think that and is an important piece that leads to attainment of a secondary school diploma or its recognized equivalent and transition to post-secondary education and training or employment so that it's leading to something that we're helping individuals to gain English that will help them further what they're trying to do um, with their goals. So some key objectives that are related to ELA is that we wanna make sure that in your program, you are providing um, students the opportunity to learn English that's accurate and appropriate in not just academic settings, but also providing them the English to interact in social settings, that you are integrating as much language as possible into those relevant life experiences, stressing that importance of critical thinking, problem solving, and self-sufficiency, self and that you're also not just working on speaking, but also listening and reading comprehension when it comes to English language acquisition. We wanna make sure that students are uh, productive in their English language skills for speaking and writing. So again, not just reading, it's really all three areas, speaking, reading, and writing. And that we do encourage you to be um, supporting students with citizen, citizenship instruction as it's appropriate for those individuals, especially those students that are ready to go through the application and the interview process. You wanna make sure that their speaking language skills, English skills are um, 
ready for that type of an interview. Now, the other piece that we talk about as 231 is English literacy and civics education. And this has been um, something that if you remember back to what I said in our introduction, that California has been doing adult education since 1856, and the focus was on um, immigrant integration, learning English, having vocational skills. So EL civics in California is really something that we have clung to and hold on to and value highly. And so much so that we have these field developed civic objective and additional assessment plans called co-apps. And that is really where students have an activity that they're doing related to an integration um, program. So perhaps it has to do with healthcare and their activity is how do you make an appointment at a doctor's office? And what do you need to get, or what do you need to do to get insurance? So those co-ops are have activities associated with them. All right, poll number two. Let me get back to that poll. We'll launch that one. So which one of these from this list is not an ELCE activity. It's like a horse race watching this. All right, let's see. We're getting up there, almost everyone. A couple more people need to respond. Of course, some of you that are thinking ahead have looked at the next slide, probably. All right, so let me share this, share the results. You can see the overwhelming number have said workforce preparation, and that is correct. Workforce preparation is part of IELCE, and that's that integrated piece that's part of 243 funding. And Corey will be talking about that um, tomorrow afternoon, I believe. And so if you are receiving 243 funding, you'll want to make sure that you attend his session. So 231 funding for EL Civics is made up of that civic participation, which is contextualized programs, um, supporting civics education, and then citizenship preparation as well. And again, with that focus of integration. The next section in 231, or the next part of 231, is adult basic education. Now, while we don't associate grade levels with adult education, you can sort of look at this as eighth grade and below. So those are for individuals that are really needing to work on those basic skills, not just in language arts, but, in, but also in mathematics. And you may have English learners that transition from English learner, English, um, literacy into some of your higher level adult basic education programs. So a model ADE program provides comprehensive services to meet that those diverse education needs of their students and you're preparing them to either transition into secondary education or vocational ed, technical ed, job preparation classes. Again, you're focusing on all the areas of language arts, as well as mathematics. And really these courses are um, designed, as we said earlier, to help students get this, receive the skills that they need that will lead them to employment or advancement on their job or entering into that whole adult secondary education program, which is our next topic area. 
So adult secondary education, you can really think of this as those high school programs, whether it is helping a student to complete their high school diploma or to um, prepare to take either the GED or the high set. Those are the two high school equivalency programs or exams that are approved by the California State Board of Education. Again, you're looking at the wide range of subjects that you would have in high school. So math and English and social studies and science and any other courses that your local school board has determined will um, lead to a uh, high school diploma that's issued to an adult. Oftentimes the number of credits are fewer than, it, than what your um, comprehensive high school students would have to have, or you're helping them to prepare for one of those tests. All right. That was fast. I hope that means that um, David and Abby might be ready. We might get to have a little longer lunch, but I'm ready to answer questions and I'm gonna stop sharing. All right, so what questions might there be? Um, uh, Carolyn, there's yeah. a couple of things in the Q&A. Um, Leticia, she says, I believe there are now seven. Um, I think maybe that was in reference to the program areas you discussed earlier. I'm, I'm not sure. And she also made a reference to pre-apprenticeship and workforce prep. Yes. Also, those pieces are part of yeah. the um, yeah, career okay, apprenticeship and then, workforce prep. Oh, okay. And then we have a another question. Could you please discuss more about HSD and HSE? All right. So, so HSD would be um, a high school diploma. So for individuals that didn't for dropped out of high school for whatever reason, didn't finish. What are what most adult programs do is you get the student's transcript and you um, determine what courses they need to meet whatever your um, high school diploma requirements are for an adult individual. So it might there there's a minimum requirement in ed code, and I don't have that off the top of my head. Perhaps one of my staff who know that, probably Neil and drop that ed code link into the chat. But there's a minimum requirement, it's about 100 to 120 credits. So it's English, math, science, basic some basic science and basic history or social studies that are required for, um, or the minimum requirements for a diploma. At the adult level, you have to meet those what you don't have to have is you don't have to have physical education. So that's that's waived for adults. But some adult schools do require students to take some elect to have some elective programs. Thanks, Neil, to have some electives as well. So you want to find make sure that you're meeting whatever the requirements are for, for your district. If you are preparing a student for the high school equivalency, there are a lot of online programs that agencies are using to help their students prepare for those exams. Both GED and HiSET have their own set of items that a student can do online. And you're just going through that curriculum and helping them prepare to take that test and, and hopefully pass the test. And I'm not sure if that, I hope that answered what the individual was looking for. Um, if not, perhaps they can ask a little more in depth of a question. Yeah. And we, we have some additional ones that um, have come up now. Ned from Claremont Adult School says, so for ELA, this is only for students looking for secondary diploma, not for students looking for general English skills. That would be the English literacy and civics. So the major difference between them is whether they want to attain that further secondary diploma is, is his question. Yeah, I mean... For your students that are really looking at that English literacy and, and civics um, program, you know, the, well, let me let me step back a moment. The goal of WIOA, I will just tell you in general, the goal of WIOA is 
because it starts out with workforce is workforce preparation. So in general, all of our students should be working towards a job. And, um, and the hope is that when they exit, they will have a, they will be getting a job or if they have a job that they will um, be moving further along in their career trajectory. So that is a piece that I think is the important part of all WIOA, which is why it's critical for collecting either social security numbers or the individual tax ID number that you have. That way we can do a data match and we don't have to, and you don't have to survey your students. I think that's something we don't talk about. We didn't talk very much about in, in this um, orientation, but that's an incredible, that's a critical piece of follow-up after students leave. And so again, the focus is on workforce preparation. And so for those students who really are looking to move through kind of an, an English language acquisition to move into a secondary diploma, yes, that focus is more on that ELA program. And I would say in general, but you will have students that are wanting to do your um, English literacy and civics education who are also moving towards that diploma. So really it allows you to be flexible at your local level. I hope that answered that, Ned. Okay, and then we have a question from Donna. Can you elaborate more on EL civics? Uh, let's see. So I'm not sure exactly what you're looking for on elaboration. Um, Corey, are you here? Wondering if you might be able to elaborate a little more on that. Corey might not be here. And Dr. Zachary, Corey is not here. Okay, that's right. He had another appointment this morning. So uh, Diana Batista, can I tap on you for that? To see if you can elaborate a little more. I don't, I don't, I'm not yeah, sure what I, else to add on to. I can't um, show my video, but the EL civics piece has been, as Carolyn mentioned um, with us for a long time. And those, <clears throat> excuse me, um, those what we call co-ops, the civic objective additional assessment plans are available at the CASAS website. You'll also find a number of them at the OTAN exchange site, which I'm sure OTAN is gonna talk about. But what they are, are is basically a short curriculum. Each one is approximately 30 hours long, and we're asking you to address language and literacy objectives. So I think Carolyn referenced uh, speaking to a doctor, or you might also uh, hear of uh, speaking to the pharmacist. So what we did was we looked at what a student would need to know in order to accomplish that skill in English. So we would look at the vocabulary that they would need, as well as the list of what sort of questions and be prepared to respond in English when the, um, the conversation begins so that they're capable of carrying on a dialogue. We also would go into more details in showing them, for example, for speaking to the pharmacist, how to read the medicine label. And then each, um, COAP has a specific list of language and literacy objectives, as well as some specific skills in that area. And then each agency develops their own assessment where you measure that the student has learned what was taught. I hope that's not too basic, but there's a lot of information at the CASAS website, and I'm sure they're going to talk about it as well. But if you have any other questions, please put it in the q and I'll be happy to add to that. Thank you so much, Diana. I appreciate you going much more in depth on that. And um, Neil has put in that there's a, um, a YouTube page for California EL Civic Support. And it really is those, um, it really is, I, I wanna say hands-on, but it's not, it's not hands-on like you would think of hands-on, but it is much more on a practical application um, it's for performance EL civics. based, definitely. Performance Anthony based. also put some resources there. Thank you, Anthony. <clears throat> and the other piece I would say is that it's also, um, it's also timely. So, for example, when um, in 2020, when we were um, preparing for the census, LAUSD developed a co-op related to 
the census. And agencies could use that co-op that was developed to help their students understand the census. When um, COVID happened, there was a COVID co-op that was put together. And so it's, um, so we can be nimble and flexible with our co-ops to really meet um, the changing times. So my guess, is, I, I know we have one on voting and you know, in 2024, we'll have a big presidential and a, a big election. So, um, so I know that that will be a co-op that will probably be used quite a bit then. Okay. Um, let's see. Yep, yeah, I'm looking at the next one from Leticia. Okay. I'm wondering um, about a tool that can measure language acquisition, listening, speaking, writing, since CASAS uh, measures reading. Um, I don't. I know we don't have any CASAS people here today. I, uh, Do we, Carolyn? This yeah. is Barbara Lehman, and, and I'm Barbara. here. Thanks, Barbara. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. Can you help um, them with that CASAS one? does. CASAS does have listening, speaking, reading, and writing assessments, and the um, they're all on the website, and they also have an essay uh, assessment that um, higher level students are, that's available, and they have an intake assessment that's not just the um, on TE. So, but those are all found on the CASAS website. And in terms of the civics, the, the um, assessments there are applied performance and you look at a rubric and develop your own, um, your own assessments. All right, thank you so much, Barbara. So the next question is also a CASAS question. And it's also, it's also a question that relates to um, the importance of having some type of a, of a conversation with a student. So the question happens to be for a student that's coming in, wants to work on their high school diploma, but they do the CASAS test and they come out, you know, in that uh, the higher level ABE um, or low level ABE. So what are you to do? So Barbara, what, what would CASAS say in that sense? on what their recommendation would be? Well, because they're still in ABE, they're considered basic skills deficient. So, and that's anybody that le that's reading below an eighth grade level. Um, not that we equate things with the grade level equivalency, but that's an easily understood um, way to explain it. And so CASAS would give them um, skill building in order to get them up to a ninth grade level or into the ASE program. There, and there are a number of different um, activities that they do and, and assessments that we do that can help the teacher facilitate that. Yeah, so really you're, you're gonna, it, you know, it's a tough one, but they really need to be working on those basic skills first as you help to move them into their high school diploma. They may not be happy with that, but I think if, if you sit down with them and, and go over their results and talk about maybe a, a plan of action on how to move a student into their high school diploma piece, then that would be a beneficial way to go, go about that. So, um, so I hope that I answered that. And then the next question, and Leticia, I'm, I'm sort of, I'm not sure I quite under, understand. Um, why aren't adult agencies required to measure language acquisition gains? So students do, we pre and post test them. I'm not sure we are looking at language gains because we're looking at literacy gains. I'm not Dr. sure. Jeffrey, she, um, I yeah. think there's a correction uh, down in the Q&A. She uh, typed level gains. Level gains. Okay. So let me go back and let me read that. Uh, Jim, can you read that one out loud? I, I can't find it. 
It's just, it's two words, level gains. Level <laughs> gains. Okay. So why aren't adult edges, why aren't we required to measure level gains? So you do measure English, you do measure educational functioning levels. So students do move through level gains. Now that's partially what we're looking, that's what we're looking for as well as measurable skill gains. So I'm not sure if that's what you're looking for. Anyone else, CDE staff or CASA staff have thoughts on that? That can... CASAS is, is looking at the different levels and starting with beginning low and going up to advanced. So, and those are um, measured by um, a raw score being converted into a, a scale score and moving up that level through um, as measured by the um, MSGs. So there are there are charts on the CASAS website that will help you to uh, determine what level a student is in. And in the listening test, because weren't we speaking about listening to begin with? There are different levels in listening as well as reading. Yes, yeah, so again, I, um, tomorrow Jay will be presenting on um, CASAS. And there is, there's so much about WIOA that we have to have, our, you know, our state leadership partners projects are critical. And each one of their websites has a great deal of information that you're going to want to go through and kind of mine and bookmark and make sure that you have that so that you're, um, so you know where to go for those different questions that you might have. So let's see, um, Neil, I kind of asked, I was wondering if you could answer this one. Yeah, uh, yeah, I could come uh, off mic. And, yeah. and, Bar and, and since Barbara's in the room, she can also help me. So when a student's transitioning to ASC, you know, we're still, uh, you know, running them through assessments for reading and listening. And um, so they might be, at a certain ELL, ELA level, even though they're in an ABE or an ASC program. So that's why it's important to, to do that assessment, do your pre and post testing, so you know what level is that. So it's, uh, and Barbara, correct me if I'm wrong, the student could be at a certain level, but they could be in a an ABE, ESL, ASC program, but they're testing at that level uh, per the CASAS test score, right? Correct. There's a cut score for CASAS. So if, and what what is found is that if most ELLs will test lower in listening than they do in reading, many of them are, you know, have a much higher reading score than a listening score, but they, depending on the test they have a, a paired score on, they will be considered ABE, um, but the students don't really need to have all of that depth of information. So if a student is unhappy about being, this is what I should have said before, unhappy about being not being in a high school class, they, you can say it's pre-high school, you know, it's how the teacher positions it to the student is what I have found personally. But yeah, so, and then many agencies only test in reading for ESL and, um, and but the federal government approved both reading and listening. You can test the listening score, the listening test. You can also test math for your ASE students. And because you want to look at a total student, um, but they, you need a paired core, a paired score for the federal government. Thanks, Barbara. I think that's an important piece about um, paired scores. So remember that you want to be in a lot of this information. These questions are going to be answered in the accountability uh, training that you're going to have a little later this week. So um, just know that we'll be coming back to these similar questions 
and information will be shared on that day. So um, Diana, I saw, you know, you're gonna answer our next question for us related to um, English language and civics education. And who is that for? So uh, the question was if the English language and civics education is more for students that are interested in community programs and not necessarily going on to post-secondary. And the answer is no, the English learner civics education topics cover a very wide variety of information, including um, when students are looking to advance educational goals. There is a whole lesson set up for students that are looking into whether it's vocational CTE or colleges, and it teaches the students how to go through and look at, um, for example, college courses, a pathway of what would be required, how to contact you know, someone at the college, there are also other lessons that are on soft skills, basic skills for workforce. Um, there's a set of lessons on um, cultural, um, trying to think of the word for it, like th that we used to use a lot for equity pieces where students get to share about their own culture. So everyone gets to learn about the other students that are in their class kind of on a personal level. But um, Barbara started to pick on you again, but I believe that there's over, well, probably close to 75 different topics right now. Some of them are workforce-based, some of them are community-based, some health, but um, it's a wide variety. And the, the where to find that information at the CASA site has been put in the chat. Go ahead, Barbara. What am I missing? Uh, before Barbara goes... Oh, thank you, Amigayla. Yeah, before Barbara goes, I want to provide some clarity to the group. You cannot have a WIO, a Title II, 231 program without uh, the English, you know, acquisition, without the training, without the co-ops. I mean, for our program, you can't do that. But we do provide state funding, a state funding model that can accommodate and has more funding for the flexible opportunities, you know, or ideas that uh, providers have. Um, the funding that we have is like a small minute portion of the, it's a supplemental portion and it has like strict guidelines. So if you look at our RFA, you look at all our documents, the CASAS documents, it tells you the things that the three things that should be there for you to do this program. So just for clarity, I just want to express that uh, we can't have it any other way. Thank you. Thank you, Amagela. I wanted to add, you also must conduct a needs assessment. You just reminded me where you survey your students on certain topics to get a feel for what they need and what they're interested in learning. And that helps you to target the instruction. Thank you, Diana. And I think that ends all of our questions. So thank you for your questions. It really does take um, our whole office because we have such a large program and um, so many agencies and it really takes all of us working together um, to provide the support to the field. Not one person can do it by themselves. 